the bridge is no longer needed that's the whole idea and if that you know the bridge is no longer needed that's great i think we've done our job in you know for our governments and our communities to say that yes we you show us so we can move it forward so that's when we know we've done our job in a particular state district Jata is the founder director of 17000 feet foundation a niche organization that has been working relentlessly to sustain the high altitude frontier villages that are facing desperate migration of young families and children to far away towns and villages in search of better education their interventions focus on upgrading school infrastructure providing better learning resources training the teachers mobilizing communities and demonstrating success at scale to further support the government to bring in a systemic reform in education their work today has already succeeded in reducing student migration by over 50% in the villages that they work in present today across the remote hamlets of ut ladakh and sikkim they have set an audacious goal to provide access and quality of education to 5 lakh children of the remotest districts in the indian himalayan region by the year 2025 an ex corporate techy sujata was awarded the prestigious nari shakti puraskar 2015 by the then president of india late shri pranab mukherjee and has also received the niti ayog's women transforming india 2019 award frequently mentioned in the media for her work she is a tedx and josh speaker and speak at multiple forums to create awareness about the remote and ignored communities of the indian himalayan region thank you ma'am for being with us today i look forward to having our conversation uh, thank you so much great to be here thank you for having me yeah. so ma'am i would like to commence this session by asking you that the compassion diligence and morals that you and the entire organization has is so valuable and inspirational so what is the story and vision behind starting the 17000 feet foundation a lot i've spoken about the story quite a bit but uh, <clears throat> uh, i think uh, let me just start by saying that uh, you know children everywhere deserve a very good education and there are hundreds uh, maybe th- hundreds of thousands of ngos who are working to do this across the country however not when uh, 12 years ago uh when i went on my first trip into ladakh which is a high altitude mountain region i realized that not much was being done uh in these remote areas and what i saw on my trip on a solo trip or solo trek actually that i went there for what i saw was hundreds and hundreds of very very tiny schools schools which is you know five children 20 children all of it struggling to impart quality education and the lack of exposure the the lack of any sustained effort by even large scale ngos it was a clearing it was a glaring gap that i saw and that's what prompted me to start 17000 feet foundation to say why can't children in these remote hamlets why do they not have access to good education why are they being forced to migrate why are young children being sent away Uh, young children you know in the pre primary age maybe uh, age 3 age 4 and 5 were being sent away by parents to far away towns just in the hope that they would get a better education and the sad part about this is these are our border areas these are the villages and the communities who help keep our borders safe if they didn't have access to good education they being forced to move i think we were sadly uh, not doing our duty by our own citizens and that was a um, i would say that was the motive for me to start 17000 feet foundation um to give children everywhere access to the same quality education that children in the plains and in the cities have access to um it was a chance solo trek i came away completely inspired by the people the communities their lifestyles their resilience and that's what 17000 feet is aiming to do is uh, give these chance give these children a chance at a much better life I think uh, what you said is something that I understood from that is that it, it turned out to be an expedition which was uh, transforming for you, and I really hope that more people start indulging with it, and that's that's something that's 
Thank so you. since you work in very remote and inaccessible areas that lie isolated and forgotten what are some of the limitations that you have faced due to the rough terrain or the geography and how do you you know uh, try to tackle them oh the challenges are quite a lot i can't even begin to tell you so let's start with you know the kind of terrains i work in today 17000 feet works in about 200 plus hamlets they're not even hamlets they're settlements Uh, in in ladakh as well as in remote areas of sikkim so geographically these areas are extremely uh, they are mountainous so they are all high altitude regions they are very sparsely populated schools have you know 20 children five children how do you plan an intervention for a school which is only 25 kids you can't ignore them either you can't say oh, the numbers are so low let's leave them alone added to this is many of these villages don't have access roads so you have to either climb up two mountains climb one mountain or drive for 10 hours over extremely rocky roads you don't even call them roads just to reach these villages many of our villages take days to reach a day two days when we started some of our villages took four days to reach um temperatures here in these villages drop down to minus 40 minus 50 degree centigrade how do teachers go there how does your team go there how do you install um, you know it's a simple thing of you know putting a sticker a label sticker on a book on a library book yeah. if if the glue is not strong enough the sticker just comes off because it is so cold you know it's simple thing like planning for how to put a little sticker on a book to how do you design uh, a solar solution or a battery that will withstand these solutions how do you design for how do you carry equipment so far away um in sikkim for example there are villages that don't have roads you have to cross um, rivers raging rivers and very old bridges across very bridges so villages are cut off for months yeah. in sikkim as well in, as well as in ladakh in ladakh they cut off for 5 to 6 months so the challenges these are the challenges over and above the challenges that you see <clears throat> that other other non profits face in improving education in rural areas the other challenges are you know teacher capability teacher motivation excess but their exposure to the outside world is limited exposure for the children is are limited they don't get to travel outside without electricity in many of these villages or mobile connectivity most of our villages don't have mobile connectivity how do you do digital education how does a child know what is outside that village the child will see a mountain and a river and that's all that he sees you know so um when when you plan for the none of the solutions that have been adopted by other organizations across the country were uh you know were relevant for us they were relevant to a certain extent the pedagogy was relevant but the implementation the last mile implementation has been a challenge our cost of just traveling to a village is possibly five times as much as it happens uh, maybe more five to 10 times more than what is faced by others uh, there's no buses there's no public transport and you have to hire vehicles uh, to drive and uh, hiring a vehicle you can't do without a four wheel drive for example but i need imagine with six months of winter it's icy and slippery how can i have my my team go on a motorcycle or a scooter not a chance so i have to send my teams in groups of four okay for safety right we have to send extremely uh, experienced drivers the vehicles have to be in, in amazing condition they have to be serviced extremely very often you got to have your snow chains with you the tires we have to replace our tires so often it's not funny right you need a vehicle without a vehicle you cannot do much then to for designing for everything has to be keeping in mind that how do you carry a 75 kilo battery across a bamboo rope bridge and then across a narrow pathway okay these are you know how do you how do you walk with that 75 kilo across two mountains how do you, if you're setting up a playground right up where we've done so many things a playground uh, let's say a swing the pole is about 8 feet 8 to 10 feet a 10 foot pole you see you can't and you have to walk for two days across a very narrow mountain path you can't put it on top only human beings can carry it you can't even put it on top of a mule on top of a mule it'll be horizontal you can't have 10 feet horizontal across a path which is 4 feet or 5 feet wide okay so it it's insane it's insane how we have managed things but uh, how do we plan for it? how we done this is by trying to work the way locals do how how have locals managed how have the communities who've lived here for centuries how are they managing so there is a lot of wisdom and a lot of learning that we've taken from what they're already doing 
there is a lot of faith and a lot of involvement of our communities to say look they have the solutions let's see can we take what they're already doing and make it better so we take their help uh, we learn uh, most of our team members are local that's the second reason why you know we need to have local people one is to give them jobs and the other is a lot of this learning comes from within they don't have the exposure or the facilities or the resources which is what 17000 feet can do well but there is a lot of inherent innate wisdom of these people which can also be utilized so uh, communities come out to help us they talk about the ways for for example you're setting up a playground in the winters beyond october november you can't you can't really set up or uh, install anything with cement the water freezes up right so i mean beyond november you can't do anything at all so we have to finish up our work by much prior to that for example there are so many things so yes we work the way locals do uh, we have a deep understanding of the region and it does it makes sense um, that you um, i think the word is you respect what the region is and the ancient wisdom that is already there and that's what has helped us we don't try and equate ourselves to so if we look at how 17000 feet is working are we successful that's a question we ask ourselves uh whereas a, 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 another ngo which is working to do the same things that we are maybe they are able to achieve better results in terms of outcomes let's say if you're looking at a library book that you're given a child and how many books do you want a child to borrow over the year or how many reading activities how many stories should he have read uh how many times can you go visit the school um so if i look at those numbers for us it will be a lot lesser because schools as often as we can yeah. as often as others do so we keep our expectations a little low and then we try and drive as much impact during those visits as we can we try and use existing systems we've had to innovate at every step of the way yeah. and yeah that's it's been interesting actually to understand that this is actually planning for the last mile Yeah. and i we believe that if we can do this in ladakh we can do this anywhere i, I think uh, when you responded to the answer i could i could feel that passion like literally oozing out of your words also and i think your entire team is driven by this idea of you know contextualizing you know how you recruit people even from the locals and acknowledging that they might not have that kind of exposure but at the same yeah. time they have the wisdom to impart that we might be unacquainted with as basic as commutations or using everyday what kind of everyday yeah. narratives do they involve in yeah. is very rich absolutely right? absolutely um, so coming from that only that you know you're you're doing multiple kinds of initiatives that way how did that initiative of 17000 feet digi lab is playing a pioneering role in delivering the digital learning opportunities to the children in the areas where there's not much electricity or mobile connectivity and as even you mentioned in the beginning that you know um, it has been challenging but still you have find out ways you figured out things so how does that so work? yeah i so tiji lab is one of my favorite and i think it's one of the biggest successes we've had so taking off from what i was talking on earlier right so i come from a um, it world i've lived and worked in the us and india in it companies for many years 15 years so for me the first thing i wanted to do was let's use digital let's use computers tablets you know, but what do you do in an area where there is no continue, there's no electricity or even even basic 2g connectivity doesn't exist so for the longest time it was a challenge but in 2018 this is what we did we finally designed a solution we said look okay there's no electricity no issues we provide it if there is no connectivity we provide it and i don't mean to say we are like like laying fiber lines or providing mobile connectivity yeah. but it is for us to understand why do we need the connectivity for what do we need the electricity for is to power all of our equipment the connectivity is to ensure that children have access to up up to date content and whatever the child is doing has to be communicated back to the stakeholders from a teacher to a headmaster to 17000 feet to the district administration everybody needs to know what's going on and you can't do it unless you physically travel to these villages right so here's how our solution worked so we said okay if such thing can't available we provide it we build it we had to build everything from scratch so this is how our digital app solution works right so every school is given a solar panel and a battery okay to provide electricity for that lab the battery was tested to withstand minus 50 degrees 
okay so idras the area in kargil which is the second coldest place in the planet the temperatures go down to 40 and 50 degrees so we tested it to make sure that you work in 50 degrees now um in this lab we provided equipment say tablets a television uh, also we put in a little server now what the server does this server is also a very small raspberry pi device the last thing we wanted to do was put in a heavy equipment which requires lots of power because that means you have to give a generator and if the generator breaks down how do you fix it because you barely know that something is wrong so we wanted low power devices a raspberry pi server just picks up 5 volts it can be charged through a usb port so a raspberry pi server all tablets are powered with that so the whole solar system gives only 5 volts or 12 volts that's it so you can't plug in anything heavy in that so we designed the, the raspberry pi was put in there just to fulfill the need for the internet because there is no internet what we said is what if we put a little server in the school the server can connect to all the tablets through a hotspot hotspot does not require internet so what happens is the server connects to all the tablets and whatever a child is learning so all the content that a child needs to learn it is put in the tablet and that it's offline but if it's like i said i need to know what he's learning i could be sitting in gurgaon in our head office or the chief education officer sitting in the main town of leh he might want to know so first steps first whatever is in the tablet whatever the child has learned it gets put onto the raspberry pi through a hotspot a basic hotspot no internet required now we said how do we get this information out to us out to the cloud right so we said look what works in ladakh today even today you'll be you'll be amazed many things are still everything people still have to travel to get anything it could be there are no banks in these places there are no great big grocery stores you want something you have to physically walk drive climb or go get it yourself so we said so a headmaster for example of a tiny little school of 20 children if he needs mid day meal supplies uniforms or he needs uh, medicine you know whatever right you have to still physically travel to the nearest large town where such some things are available and pick it up right so if the headmaster is going there why can't the data go with him so we built another app and we said look he said he's doing it anyway this app stays on the phone of the headmaster the headmaster's app it connects to the little server it downloads all student data so whenever he travels he'll travel once a month sometimes twice a month the minute he travels he'll go to a connected zone 90% he will go when he goes to a connected zone it gets pushed up to the internet automatically and any updates like you know uh, software upgrades new content that will get pushed down to his phone when he goes back to the school that gets pushed down automatically to the server server to tablet so now all the data is in the cloud anyone can see what's going on and the child has access to latest content it's not real and live as in it's not live data but it could be 15 days old and which is not too bad considering they didn't have connectivity at all so what have we done we've done today is every child has access to a beautiful 10 inch tablet with amazing you know highly interactive content it's personalized he can learn at his pace he will score whatever he scores but the teacher sitting in the school has access to what she's seeing uh, what every child is doing and i am sitting here in gurgaon or my funder or the government wherever they are they can know that child a in school x has done so much and then hence keep the system in track and um, the system's working amazing it's working now in 160 schools uh, of course they don't have access to internet per se they don't have facebook and insta and youtube and whatever but they have what it takes to uh, you know put in digital education which is really really important because it helps the teachers teach better it helps a child learn at their own place pace and today um, i'm really proud to say that we are now taking this solution to sikkim and sikkim has in similarly uh, very remote uh, schools which don't have internet connectivity and that there is no other solution like this across the country that i know of because everyone still trying to provide access to connected zones so it doesn't matter if you're sitting in a no electricity or uh, minus 50 degrees or you know no mobile connectivity you still have access to everything yeah so we proud of this yeah i i mean it took me a while to even register the entire process when you were talking about it and you know 
hot sorry <laughs> no 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 it is this gives me a thought of you know how much thoughts and processing has gone into it. it it's not like you know today you decided that you want the internet uh, being available to each and every student it takes that entire pioneering and you know when you spoke about ki to even contextualize it in a way ki the headmaster is going himself so why not make yeah. them as an important stakeholder yes is, very true is, very important yeah and uh, especially one thing that that makes me curious also is about the teaching methodologies and that's mm-hmm. my follow up question on this that you know how are you building the capacities of teachers through the multiple methodologies in training to ensure that you know an effective learning experience is given to the children that while yeah. you're trying that how how does that take place so we have to understand these are government school teachers they haven't had much exposure uh, to the outside it's only now that people have started even rem- understanding where is ladakh thanks to you know us becoming union territory and things like that right so these teachers haven't had much exposure and so now we are asking them to get away to say okay you have your traditional chalk and talk there's a blackboard now to start using tablets so it's a it's a huge jump it's a huge jump for even teachers in private aspiration schools right so we have to do a lot of training sessions and hand holding is super important and we also like as i said, keep our expectations lower than uh, uh you know then we should be in the sense that it, we we understand one thing that in it, it takes probably 6 to 8 months for them to be comfortable with the technology for it takes us few months for the child to ensure the child is at least getting you know 30 to 45 minutes of tablet time in a in a week let's say per subject whatever the case may be so we understand it's a longish process and we should not say oh my god learning is going to change overnight it's not going to happen it will take 3 years 5 years so we do multiple training sessions with the teachers we call them all into a central area and we do 3 4 5 days of training we hold the teacher and the headmaster accountable for the kind of usage that the platform should see we train them on ways in which they can use this in a blended learning format so a teacher will evolve her own way as to how she wants to use the tablet um the headmaster will figure out how she he or she can uh, schedule the, the lab usage and the most key part i would say about how we work with 17 uh, with our tablets is how we involve the communities you see the, the difference in our schools in ladakh sikkim these remote areas we work in is a community plays a very very large role and the reason for this is simple if you imagine walking for two days and coming or driving for six hours and then reaching one village which has 50 60 homes and nothing else the school is an important part of that village right so everyone is invested in that school and if the community is not invested then the school cannot run so communities actually help in a lot of the work in even setting up the digital lab setting up the solar pole maintaining the solar uh, to you know talking to the teachers and saying what how they can help so we involve the communities in sensitizing them and saying look the child needs to use the tablet or the child needs to use a library book it's extremely important so we we conduct workshops with them to encourage their children to do better or to continue to do better so um we work with the communities we work with teachers we work directly with students headmasters and the government the big the other big thing is the government so Uh, like right now we're getting into a project where the government the uh, ladakh autonomous hill development council lay district is now adopting this digital app project and, and they're rolling it out into their all their constituency schools uh, so this is their initiative which means they've adopted our project we're going to work with them in rolling it out in the schools but the ownership is theirs it is their project it is their schools they will drive and create systems around it so when there's ownership at all levels from Uh, community teachers government uh children it makes a big deal of a difference but like i told you it takes years uh this is something that we keep our expectations and we've been we've been very surprised at how much for a community which is the, which is you know barely seen smartphones or areas where there's no internet connectivity how amazingly teachers have taken to it they're a highly motivated lot teachers, i think this momentum that you created has has buzzed into a very huge like you know why you're again and again saying that uh, buzz yes but when you say na, that you know we, we don't keep our expectations much hearing it from a perspective of an outsider i do believe and i think that it has made a massive impact 
then uh, you're even considering yourself too so that that's one part of it and even while i was reading about the entire initiative there were multiple things to it the library part again the digital learning part and multiple other aspects and that made me curious about you know what was the vision behind creating these dynamic libraries and reading space especially in each and every school of ladakh and how yes. has it impacted the learning outcomes for the children so you have to say yeah sure i'll happy answer that so we started with the library project and once we realized uh, early on this was 10 years ago that we started the library project we adopted 100 schools uh, you won't believe it the teachers parents communities hadn't seen story books at that time i mean imagine the child not seeing a story book i mean i've grown up with story books it was really amazing i had teachers look you know like touch the books and say wow these are such lovely looking story books you're giving it to us for free so we realized at that point that you know there is a lot of change to happen and if we put a lot of things into it at one shot and expect way too much it's not going to happen so we started off with libraries to just you know increase the exposure for our teachers and our children honestly they hadn't seen the outside world most of these children do not see the you know like pangong lake the famous pangong lake that everybody wants to see in ladakh there are villages around it but the children there largely have never been outside their village you might get 2 lakh visitors to that lake but a little tiny village just about you know 10 km 5 km away with a school with five children i don't think these children have ever gone beyond that lake not seen anything so we wanted to first introduce this outside world to these children get that exposure so if you look at the so we started with the library program and i'll show you how the impact spread and how it helped the library program was for us even that was approached with okay give the books to children to read just give it it doesn't matter if it's torn doesn't matter if they don't really read it let them get into a habit of knowing that there is a world outside their little tiny hamlets from there we started pushing them on to okay you need to read at least two books a month every child okay to answering questions on those books to, to do doing activities with those books right do drama storytelling making puppets a whole bunch of things so build a whole curriculum around it give them goals every quarter every uh, month not monthly but at least every quarter every half yearly and so on and the, the better performing schools the schools where the teachers communities children showed a very active involvement of the library program got way more work more support from 17000 people so we started upgrading their schools and one part of a library program was to involve the communities we told the children get your parents in and let them hear you reading english because that's an aspiration for our communities that my child should read in english should be able to speak english it's a big thing their 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 uh, uh, curriculum is english based so for them for for a villager a parent in a very remote corner of india what's he going or he or she going to even judge whether his child is well educated or not it's by how comfortably they speak english it's the truth yeah it's unfortunate but it's true so we would say this you know get your parent here let them you read stories to them in english let them know you're speaking and in return you listen to their stories listen to the community stories the folklore that's been going on for centuries right get that to have this exchange let the parent know what's happening in the school in your life okay and you continue to stay in touch with so you're not losing out on what your community is doing and the more the parents got involved the more the school started performing well we started upgrading the schools painting the schools carpeting furniture children are sitting in cold floors minus 25 degrees uh, it was i mean during winters it is so cold that they cannot use the classrooms inside they go sit outside where it's sunny they just you know put out a rug and sit in the in the sink so um we started out by putting furniture for the classrooms i mean 100 150 180 schools of ours have classroom furniture for the first time uh, painted the whole schools made them look better gave them playgrounds children had nothing to play with yeah. so these became aspirational so it was not just reading reading per se the impact it was about are you coming together to understand that look the school is a beautiful place that the child has to have access to a lot more he has to develop a lot more and he needs multiple things for this to happen from community involvement to better learning resources to a better way to um a better school atmosphere so so yeah so each while each program has its own metrics of saying okay how many books have they read how many words can they read and so on and so forth overall we also see how well equipped the community is how much the headmaster has been able to take 
what we have given and how much further they can carry. So I'll give you an example of an impact, right? Yeah. Uh, there was a, there's a school in a very remote village, not a very remote village, but a remote village of Kargil, which had two classrooms. Um, and when we approached them, uh, we asked them about, uh, you know, we said, look, based on a library program, we'll do more, but you have to show us that your children are reading. Um, part of the incentive was to give them classroom furniture, a playground, but they didn't have space. Um, I said, look, we cannot build space for you. You have to try and get that space yourself. And you do have access. You can go to the local government and advocate. Early days, they were like, Hame koi nahi sunta hai. I said, no, you have your rights, go. So what we did as year one gave them a lot of hope to say, yes, 70,000 people supporting us, which means we should be able to support ourselves. From the first year onwards, we, we said, we have all your equipment with us. Prove to us that you guys can carry this forward and we'll help you double. You come one step, we'll come two. So that same school, over two years, they've been approaching the government. They didn't have an access road to their village. They got that built. Um, they didn't have a ground. They've got that level. They mobilized funds themselves. They now have two buildings, multiple floors, extra classrooms. There weren't enough rooms for the children to sit. And 17,000 people supported them by putting the ditchy lab, the furniture, the carpeting, the paint, the playground, whatever it is. We sat on their equipment for two years. So we said, we'll do this when you're good and ready. Last, uh, about a month ago, I went to the school and the, the, the SMC chairman, that's a school management committee or village education committee as it's called. He was giving us a presentation, mind you, a PowerPoint presentation on a computer of how much his school has progressed from year one to now year four in terms of enrollment, learning outcomes, prizes received, infrastructure upgrade. That's the impact that we have. We are able to allow communities to, you know, um, have a lot of ownership in their, their own uh, school, the uh, future of their children and so on. Yeah, it was really great to see. I think when, when you talk about this, I feel like you're the bridge. So there's point A to point B and how do you attain that? So you and 17,000 Feet Foundation becomes that bridging, a bridge that gap thing when you're speaking about it. So no, that, you have to, I have to tell you this, thank you for saying that because we are exactly that. We are not the doers, okay? And I'm so happy you figured that because uh, yes, we are the bridge, we are the facilitators and we believe if a community, a school, a headmaster can carry certain things forward and take it to much better heights, We've done our job. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's always been our always been our motto. So all hail in that motto. And uh, my next question to you is: What is your approach about partnerships for strengthening and amplifying the work that you've been doing? Yeah, good question. Uh, this is a question that every NGO but this all should answer, you know. <laughs> so it is like you said, we are a bridge, right? And as a bridge, the bridge. Um, well, the bridge can stay there forever, but there should be a bridge in every community then, and there should be some way or the other. If we, if we are not the bridge, a community should be able to build that bridge on their own, at least learn from what we've done. So if for us, um, from year one, we've held ourselves accountable by the fact that how much are the communities achieving, how much are the schools achieving, and a little later on, further down the road, how much is the government able to do? Because no matter what you say and do, the government has the best reach, the best resources. And they're the only ones who are completely and always invested in their community, right? And it was important for us. So government partnership is extremely important for, for what we do from, I mean, I would have wanted to do this in year one, but government partnerships and uh, these, these kind of things take a long time to happen. We've always worked in partnership with the government and uh, over you know each program three to four five years within the uh, within the duration of a particular program is when we see that the government says that okay this does work so uh, how do they see it? because we work across you know 20 30 percent of the schools and that's quite a large pilot size you know and we've taken the most difficult schools the most unreachable inaccessible um, you know it takes you three days of a walk 17,000 you know we have a criteria for selecting schools how far is it? Okay. What are all the challenges that are there? If, if those things have boxes filled in, then we will take it. How involved is the community, right? How many children are there? Of course, it doesn't matter because we do look for at least 10, 15 children in the school. And we said, we'll go there. 
but so we have what we have done we've shown success across hundreds of schools which are extremely remote challenging we have ways to monitor way to ways to um, mobilize communities and teachers and seeing this we what we do is we we constantly advocate with the government say look these projects have worked here can we now work with you to build a similar system for the rest of your schools right and that advocacy we are constantly advocating with the government constantly and it's a very important part of what we do and like to, to give you an example right now we are working with the lhdc lay to uh, to roll out a digi lab across almost all the schools of lay district which is a big deal for example our library program is adopted our furniture so for the longest time we kept saying that children need classroom furniture yeah make the school look like a good place it shouldn't look run down it's just a simple thing that's what you and i take for granted for our kids so why not them and i happy to say that you know in the three years of our project i mean the government picked it up both sides both districts they were able to uh, mobilize that and set this up and we've advocated for anganwadi centers to be closer to um, or at least be in the same premises of the primary schools much below the national education policy recommended it they recommended it now and the government has moved it you know they they found merit in what we've said they take um, the uh, we we have constant talks with them they have their committees we put forward our viewpoint so that's what we want to achieve end of the day if we are a bridge um, over time a road will get built and the bridge is no longer needed that's the whole idea and if that you know the bridge is no longer needed that's great i think we've done a job in you know for our governments and our communities to say that yes we you shown us that we can move it forward so that's when we know we've done our job in a particular state district or maybe a block um so when the system is moving by itself so it's a very important part the other bit of our collaborations also is we also work with many other non profits to try and bring their expertise here i constantly advocate i keep saying don't don't think ladakh is hard yes but the work with us will tell you how it is get your expertise here this community can can uh, benefit from this and i believe if i <clears throat> and i do believe we've been successful there as well if we're able to show the way give them some confidence that yes you can work in ladakh many other non profits have come forward so those also work and which means to say i mean they're not completely dependent on us all the time we don't want the community to be dependent on us yeah i couldn't have concluded it so beautifully and you know uh, <laughs> where, where i was like all uh, done was when you said that you know there'll be a time when the bridge won't be needed and there'll be a road to take that way so yes. thank you so much for that and i hope that that does happen and based I on how see. much you've achieved so far i do think that it will happen way sooner than you're imagining it to be so thank you ma'am again thanks for your time and it was a great learning opportunity for us as well to you know explore these intricacies which we might have known about but never knew how that journey has been so far and and that's very important for us so perfect thank you. thank you so much and thanks for doing these talks it's great for everyone to know what's happening and uh, yeah we all learn from each other's ideas as well